Good morning. There we go. Uh, today is, well, I guess technically now afternoon. Uh, good afternoon. Today is Thursday, March 4th, uh, 2021. Uh, we are going to finish up our discussion of bone physiology today in lecture and then start our discussion of the joints. I will say that the joints, I think, uh, are the part of this section that I think most people find most challenging. Not because I think it's particularly hard, it's just because of the vocabulary involved, right? When you're talking about synchondroses and symphyses and uh, syndesmoses and all of these fun words and vocabulary that are going to be fun to spell, it makes it kind of challenging for people. But uh, we'll do our best to make some sense of it and uh, help you to be successful in that. Also, uh, as uh, you were warned on uh, Tuesday, we are going to start our group presentations uh, with the appendicular skeleton, with the upper part of the body. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody because there's some rubble. Uh, but again, you're of course welcome to unmute when you uh, need to talk. Um, uh, with the appendicular skeleton, like last time, we'll break up into groups during the uh, uh, before the presentations to give you some chance to prepare. If you're not as prepared as you could be, uh, I know I've several students have reached out to me saying that they've tried to communicate with their groups uh, through the discussion board and haven't gotten a lot of feedback. So hopefully that is something you guys will uh, be better about paying attention to in the future if we do these types of things. Uh, we do have two more assignments due also on Tuesday. The first is Unit Nine review. Again, I want to strongly encourage you to uh, work together on all assignments to help each other. The best way to learn something is to teach to somebody else, but I also want to strongly remind you uh, that it is important to make sure you write the answers in your own words. Uh, there's nothing I love more than reading the completely meaningless state, uh, statement that uh, calcium is inorganic and collagen is organic as the answer for number six on the uh, check your understanding from the last one from a quarter of the class. So as enjoyable as it is to do that, I don't know where you're getting that statement. It is completely meaningless and stupid, uh, but I'm sure it came from some um, uh, Quizlet or some other thing that you guys have found. But uh, if you're going to make a statement like that, right or wrong, please write it in your own words and don't just uh, copy it verbatim word for word from wherever you guys decided to get that. Uh, it is important. Uh, again, the point of these things is for you guys to learn. If you're not putting time, if you're not putting effort into these homework assignments, then they're not doing you any good. It's not busy work. I didn't give you these things because I, I feel you have things you need to do. This is directed studying. So make sure you're putting the time and effort necessary into that to allow it to do its job, which is to help you to learn this material. Speaking of which, we do have a 30 point skeletal review that is due that is going to be graded for correctness. And again, I encourage you to work together in your groups or set your own groups up uh, to be able to work on this. I encourage that because uh, again, it is important, but remember to put the answers in your own word. Now, obviously if the, it's a one word answer, I think as we learned from last time, for instance, if there was a question on the review that said what uh, vertebrae looks like a giraffe, then you're just, of course just going to write cervical or whatever the right answer might be. And there's a one word answer for that. Obviously that's not what I'm talking about. But if you have to describe uh, scurvy or, or not scurvy, but uh, um, uh, uh, lordis or, or some other type, you know, one of those types of things where it requires uh, a sentence or two, make sure you are using your own words to do that. Uh, I will penalize people who do not write things in their own words on that as well as not having the correct answers because the point of all of this is to help you to prepare for the exam. And that is Thursday, uh, March 11th. Again, same format as the previous two. Uh, no more surprises. You know exactly what to expect from the exams. We had fewer problems with the questions being presented one at a time than we did with them being presented all at a time. So I will continue to use that format for now. Uh, but again, everybody now has experienced it from the second exam. So you know what is expected of you. You know what I'm looking for for the questions. You know what I'm looking for for the answers. Uh, so hopefully uh, you, the scores will come up significantly on these exams as you guys better prepare for them. Uh, as always with a Thursday exam, 
uh, with a Thursday exam. Uh, we've got five days off before the next class. And so to help you to use that time wisely, to encourage you to start looking ahead at the next material, which is the muscular system. I have uh, not one, but two pre-labs that you are gonna be turning in. So after the exam on Thursday, I want you to take a good 15, 20 minute break. And then I'd want you diving right into the muscular system uh, with the two pre-labs, the unit 10 and the unit 11 pre-labs that are gonna be due at the beginning of class on Tuesday. All right, questions on any of that? I have a question for our appendicular group presentation. So we stay in the same group, right? Yes. If we had number four last time, we have it again this time? Yes. And we will have a little time to work on it today. Uh, I, again, I'll put you in the groups to organize ahead of time, but you should have been preparing. And again, uh, I don't recall offhand what groups are presenting because again, it's not, we're not doing it in numerical order of the groups. We are doing it in, hold on, let me stop sharing this for a second. We're doing it based on topic. So as I said in last class, we are doing the upper appendage. So it looks like, let me get to the right place. Uh, groups eight, group seven, group six, and group five. Those are the groups that we'll be presenting today. And then the other four groups will be presenting on uh, Tuesday. So that is the game plan for today. All right, questions on any of that? Any other questions? Nope, did, okay, excellent. All righty, then in that case, let's dive back into lecture. All right, we have been working our way furiously through bone physiology. Quick review. How many different ways are there to make bones? Two. Two, what were they again? Central members ossification and endochondrial ossification. Excellent. How many ways are there to grow bones? Two ways. Two. And what are they? Interstitial and oppositional. Okay, those are the growth processes that are used, but technically I would say the two ways we grow bones are in length and width. But you guys oh. absolutely have the right idea. We grow the bones in length using uh, interstitial growth in the epiphyseal plate. We grow in width using appositional growth underneath the periosteum. So technically the answer to the question was length and width. You gave me an answer to a harder question, but you guys had the right idea. That is where those are gonna take place. And quite frankly, that was gonna be my next question anyway. So you guys just beat me to it. So uh, if you asked on the exam, for example, I mean, probably not, but the simple question of how yeah. do you, what are the two ways to grow in bones, appositional and uh, interstitial would be wrong? Yes. Okay. Those are the growth methods, but if we are, if we are, again, it's not a question that would be on the exam, but uh, again, when you have that baby bone and you want to turn it into adult bone, there's two ways you have to grow it. You have to make it longer. You have to make it wider. Now you are correct. We use those two growth processes, interstitial growth to make it longer, appositional growth to make it wider. But uh, so again, it, it, it's not a question that would be on the exam. I probably would mark it right if it was, but it's, it's like you said, it's a very basic question. The point is just to remind us of the things that we've talked about. Like for instance, what were the three main factors that are necessary or influence our maintenance of bones? Uh, exercise, hormones. And diet. And yeah, diet. nutrition. Name. Tristan diet. Excellent. 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 Right. And remember, especially when we were talking about hormones, we were talking about how important those hormones are not e just for helping us to maintain healthy bones, but also helping us to maintain an appropriate level of calcium. And again, if it comes to calcium and healthy, big, healthy bones, calcium is going to win every time. Excuse me. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. All right. So that is all the stuff we have covered, which means there's really only one major homeostatic process we have left to talk about. How to repair a bone when it has been damaged. 
Of course, if we're going to repair a bone from damage, we have to damage the bone first. So let's talk about the different ways that we can damage a bone. Uh, one of those uh, is when we're talking about a fracture, which is typically what happens when we break a bone. Uh, fractures are basically classified by one of two basic uh, categories, either being a closed fracture or an open fracture. So when we talk about this, these are the general classifications. What do we mean when we say a fracture is closed or a simple fracture? Is that like it hasn't broken the skin or is it exactly. like inside? No, absolutely. That it means that it hasn't broken through the skin. It is still being maintained inside of the skin. However, an open or what is also known as a compound fracture then is when the bone has penetrated through the skin. So if you can see the bone, it is an open or a compound fracture. If you cannot see the bone, it is closed and it is simple. Right. So again, that's a pretty basic, pretty general definition. But obviously, as you can see from this picture from your textbook, there are lots of different uh, specific classifications for fractures. So when we talk about these specific classifications, we want to be able to identify those as well. Obvious, uh, the, the most basic of these is what we call a transverse fracture. When we talk about a transverse fracture, basically this is a fracture and I'll steal the whiteboard um, and draw our bone. Actually, let's draw a square. A transverse fracture is basically a fracture that occurs perpendicular to the axis. So again, we have the longitudinal axis of the bone and a transverse fracture basically is a, a fracture that occurs along the longitudinal axis, right? So basically it's a break across the bone in that type of fashion that way. Now, when talking about transverse fractures, we can also describe them and several of the other types of fractures we'll talk about as well as being displaced. What does it mean if a fracture is displaced? Compound fracture. Not necessarily compound. It doesn't. It, now, you are correct in that often when it is displaced, it becomes compound. But why? What actually happens when the when the fracture is displaced? Is it just that it moves away from where it's supposed to be? Yeah. Basically, it means the two pieces are no longer aligned with each other. Now, you're right. When the bone displaces like that, often it can break through the skin. But it is actually possible to have a displaced fracture that doesn't penetrate the skin. In fact, the illustration they have here in your textbook, I would argue, most likely didn't. Um, so here you can see it has been slightly displaced, but likely hasn't broken through. However, this one underneath it, it's quite possible this one has been displaced enough. And where we look at where the musculature is, it's likely that this one may have uh, displaced to a point where it broke through the surface of the skin. So again, displaced fracture basically doesn't have to um, break through the skin, but you are right in that often it does. All right, again, this is one that has been in the news recently, thanks to Tiger Woods, a comminuted fracture. I've heard that phrase three times this week and was very excited about it, uh, not because I was upset, no, I'm happy that uh, Tiger got injured. I was very, very sad about that, but I knew we were gonna be talking about that. So hopefully you picked it up in the news. It's always fun when AMP information makes it out into the news, although this is a fairly depressing way that it occurred. It happened and, in our class. I'm sorry? It happened during our class. Oh, was it, was it during class that it actually happened? Yeah, I remember. I was going to mention it because I didn't. I didn't know if you like were following all of that. I was like, oh, uh, I, uh, I didn't. Fight, I didn't. I didn't hear. Uh, no, actually, Arthur, he was uh, driving his car down a hill in Southern California. Lost control of the car, slammed into the median divider, rolled into a ditch, flipped the car several times and has comminuted fractures, I think of both legs, or at least one, at least one leg he's got where they've had to put in pins and other things like that. But 
the point being that what it means to have a comminuted fracture is that it is broken into more than two pieces, right? If we go back to that, yeah, exactly. Especially because he's like, you know, three weeks out from, uh, or four weeks out from uh, back surgery and was just looking at making a comeback. So again, very depressing. They think he may be done. Um, with that simple transverse fracture, basically that one bone becomes two pieces. With a comminuted fracture, what ends up happening is typically you get what they call a shattering of the bone, where the bone is broken into multiple pieces. Now, this type of injury is more frequent in elderly individuals, because as we know, as we get older, we lose bone density and more of the collagen fibers are ossified in them. So they have less flexibility, they have less give, but as we see, obviously it can happen to anybody uh, as, it did for, um, as it did for Tiger. Um. Laura, you had a question? Um, so between um, the closed and open fractures, is one more severe or is it always, um, it just depends on where and. It's a great question. Um, I guess part of it is what you mean by severe. Um, I mean, I guess if we, if we're thinking of in terms of how it's going to heal, let's actually go back to um, that, this generic picture, right? In the case with a simple transverse fracture, where the bone has penetrated through the, the, the skin. Obviously mm -hmm. you're damaging muscle and, and potentially muscle and, and ligaments and definitely the skin and things along those lines, but it's a single break. So once it is put back into place, uh, recovery could be uh, relatively easy. Whereas with a common muted fracture where you've got a shattering of the bone, even if that shattering of the bone doesn't break through the surface of the skin, when you've got lots of little pieces in there, it can be challenging to recover from that. You don't get as much peripheral damage uh, of the muscles in the skin and, and ligaments potentially from that, but it can be much harder to get the bone to repair in that situation. So I think a transverse, even an open transverse fracture, would the bone would heal faster than a comminuted. The problem is you would have more peripheral damage uh, that you would also need to heal from with that display. So I think that, that it really depends on the type and, and also the location, the location and the type of location, I think. So I don't think that there's a simple answer that one is worse than the other. Okay, thank you. Do they fix the comminuted fracture with like pins and stuff like that to keep it in place? Often, yes, that requires, uh, it requires some type because uh, you need, as we'll see when we talk about the healing process, we need a, a framework for the bone to be able to grow around and to form. And so when you have all those shattered pieces like that, you need some type of framework. So typically they will use things like pins or plates to stabilize the bone pieces where we want them to be so that they can regrow back together. Yes. That is so interesting. Thank yep. you. Again, it, it's very cool and very interesting to think about until it happens to you. Then <laughs> It's not so cool and interesting anymore. But, but I agree uh, that these things definitely are. Uh, Madison, did you have another question? Um, I actually have like a personal reference to a commuted fracture. Uh, okay. My grandma broke her femur at the uh, distal part of it, closest to the knee, the medial part, and then right at like right before her hip attached. Oh, wow. And they had to put at least they had to put kind of a cage for a little bit, like a cage of pins around her knee area. And then she had to go, she had two pins stabilizing the center of her femur. And then she had like a part of like a pretty much a hip replacement at that point. And it took her about a year and a half. She was 75 when it happened. And then she had to go back in and get 
pretty much four of the pins removed and restabilized year a year later after being able to walk wow. so that she could just kind of have a normal leg. So a commuted fracture, it, it takes a lot longer because you have to go through several surgeries well, in order to stabilize it. The fact that she was older probably influenced oh, absolutely. the rate of, of healing as well for that as well. Well, she's so, 75. Actually, she shouldn't be pruning her apple trees. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, but so how long ago did that happen? It was about 10 years ago. And how is she now? Uh, she's good. She's, so, you know, walking around totally fine. It just was a really, really long process. Well, so that's, I think that kind of answers Yulia's question where she was asking if these fractures bother you for all your life. Uh, in many instances, not all of them, but in many instances, and again, it depends a lot on which bone and where and the type of fracture. Many, as we'll see, many fractures actually to heal stronger than they were before. Oh, absolutely. However, something like this common muted fracture, especially something in somebody elderly, there absolutely could be lingering effects from that. And typically, and it takes much, much longer, a year and a half to heal bone is, is a long time. But as you mentioned, there is a tremendous amount of injury. And so the fact that she's able to walk at all shows just how powerful this process is and how strong these bones can be afterwards. Absolutely. I think so, getting out uh, while you were talking, I also caught some of the other comments. Yes, the other issue with an open fracture is an increased likelihood of infection. So definitely that is uh, something that people ask, asked about as well. Yeah, and again, uh, with things like a common unit and the spiral, which we'll talk about, I think next. Um, yes, typically you need uh, uh, halos or pins or plates or things like that to, to stabilize them. And, and often those are removed uh, after the fact. Oh, well, the many times the pins are left in place. And that's to keep um, the bones from not shifting, right? Until Correct. they're done. Yeah. To keep them properly aligned so that they can okay. them. Excellent. And as mentioned, is a great uh, lead into a spiral fracture. While comminuted fractures are more common in elderly people where the bone is more fragile and more likely to shatter, spiral fr uh, fractures are much more common in uh, adolescents or young adults. Uh, these are very common uh, sports fractures, some for, uh, so associated with physical activity where you basically get some type of twisting or turning force on the bone that causes that. So that could be running across a soccer field and stepping into uh, you know, a gopher hole or something along those lines, or little Timmy's bouncing on the couch and is about to fall onto the glass coffee table and mom grabs him and twists his arm as she pulls him away from the coffee table. And that can cause that twisting fracture. At least that's what you tell Child Protective Services. Uh, and uh, again, it's that kind of an excessive twisting force, which, and again, I, I, you know, I've been drawing these, but as you can see, the, the, I'm limited in my drawing skills. I'm not even gonna try to draw this spiral one where that twisting of the bone causes a shearing and tearing of it. Again, this uh, typically does require some type of stabilization with pins or plates uh, from that sharing that takes place. Wowzers. Well, maybe you shouldn't have been racing dirt spikes at two years old. <laughs> oh, you were too. Okay, that makes more sense. <laughs> Yeah, that is, that is impressive. He must have a high tolerance for pain as well. Wowzers. All right. Next type of fracture we want to talk about is a compression fracture. A compression fracture occurs where basically you get a crushing or a smashing of the bone basically between two forces. This is most commonly associated with, as it says here in the illustration, a fall. So for instance, you're roller skating or ice blading uh, or ice skating or something like that, and you fall. And so you have the acceleration coming downward and then you hit the ice and that force of hitting the ice coming upward basically crushes that bone in between those two forces with this type of fracture is very common as we see here in the vertebral column associated, like I said, with falls or things along those lines. However, the other place that you see these compression type fractures occur in uh, people who have 
uh, failed in suicide attempts. Right? Probably happens in ones that are successful in full suicide attempts, but if you're successful in suicide, we don't care as much about the broken bones. But you have that individual who jumps off a bridge, and as they're accelerating towards the water, they are coming downward off the bridge towards the water. They hit the water with that upward force. And so often what will happen is you will get this pulverizing or crushing of the long bones in the leg as a result of that. So in the femur or in the tibia, you can get those types of, of compression or crushing types of fractures from that type of uh, activity. These compression fractures, yeah, kind of like crushing a crayon. These compression fractures are similar, but slightly different from a depression fracture. A depression fracture is what occurs when you have a bone and you get a force that is accelerated to it from just one side. So instead of catching, instead of landing on your, uh, on your uh, tailbone and having that compression of the vertebral column, maybe instead you hit your head on something. Or maybe like this individual here, your wife has told you to take you out the garbage for the umpteenth time and is finally mad about it. And so she takes the hammer to you. Uh, so again, these are very common fractures that you see in the head. Of course, if you see her coming, you could always hold up your arm and then get that compression, that depression fracture on the forearm as well. But are you again, doing okay, Professor? <laughs> yes, I'll blink twice if I need help. Don't worry. <laughs> I was waiting for someone to ask that. <laughs> the amount of times you have brought up child protective services makes me think that you actually had experience with them. So that makes me worried. Well, like any good parent, I beat my children. What can I say? <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Look, I, it, it, we're sitting here for four and a half hours. There's got to be some, you know, levity to it. Otherwise, this would be exhausting and boring. Yes, take everything that I say with a grain of salt. I'm, I, I'm rarely serious about these types of things. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the point being, again, I like colorful examples. And while they're silly and they're stupid, often the silly and the stupid things are the things that people help to remember. I, I, I mentioned before how much I love mnemonics. And I think mnemonics are incredibly powerful things. My absolute favorite mnemonic is this one. So what is that? Is that a sad statement on today's society? Are those all the fractures? No, it, it, this has absolutely nothing to do with uh, with anatomy and physiology. Oh, okay. Does anybody, Wait, does anybody know what that is? No, you have, have to tell idea what, what it is. It, isn't it like where you put like a comma? Like over each word or like before each word and it like not, not not a bad guess you're getting closer but all right back in ancient times and by ancient times I mean when I was in eighth grade. Right, uh, they the, the United States government had decided had decided that you know what the whole rest of the world uses the metric system, it is time for us to use the metric system as well so guess what guys. On Thursday, we're switching to the metric system. And so in school, we all had to scramble in eighth grade to learn the metric system because on Thursday, it was going to come. Of course, Thursday came and nothing ever happened. But way back in eighth grade, which was something like 75 years ago for me now, this was the mnemonic that our teachers gave us, which tells you something about the education I got as an eighth grader to help us to remember our metric system. Because if you think about it, if you do it in terms of meters, you have kilometers, hectometers, decameters, meters, decimeters, centimeters, and millimeters. And for whatever reason, even though I learned this in eighth grade, it is stuck in my brain. So like I said, sometimes the silly examples, sometimes the silly mnemonics, sometimes those kind of goofy things, even though they're silly, even though they're stupid, sometimes those are the things that help you to remember things. And so, yeah, I use silly examples because, uh, a, it amuses me, and B, uh, because sometimes those silly things help you to remember stuff. All right, there you go, excellent. All right, so 
The point of all of this is the big difference between a compression and a depression is compression. Basically, you're getting that acceleration from both sides. So it crushes the bone in between where a depression, you're pretty much getting that, ind that indentation on the bone from just a force to one side. Yes, there are a couple questions. Yeah, I have a question. So do these depression fractures normally not hurt your brain or do they normally put like have a big potential risk of harming your brain? Um, so here's what I would say to that. Uh, the key with a depression is it doesn't go all the way through the bone. So you're not going all the way through the bone that way. However, uh, obviously the concussion of it can have an impact on and could cause potential brain damage. So yes, it is not a good idea to hit somebody in the head with a hammer or uh, when someone falls and, and hits their skull, that could cause that problem. It could also cause internal bleeding. It could cause other problems that way as well. So it, it, the blow itself would not directly injure the brain, but either by causing internal injury or causing some type of concussion, a concussive force or something like that, it could cause problems that way. All right, uh, Dimitra, yes. <clears throat> uh, what kind of fracture would it be if, for example, uh, there was a very powerful pulling force and you lost a limb or a finger. Um, well, if, 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 if it was separated at the joint, then that wouldn't be a fracture because you wouldn't actually be damaging the, the bone. You would basically just be tearing that portion of it off at, uh, at the location where a joint is. So most likely that would be if it, if it occurred during the joint. Now, if, if it occurred in the middle of the bone, then obviously it would probably, it would depend on what it would be. It could be a crushing fat that, that pulverized. Are you, it are, you, professor, are you sensitive to like blood, like images? <laughs> I, I just the fact that you asked that question i find is hilarious i i, I don't want to get too far off topic I, 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 why don't you save that for something like that i, I oh gross i don't know what that is that's a thing gloved who's that's my brother's finger he uh he basically the he was on a dirt bike and he tried doing a wheelie and one of the his finger got caught in the spokes and it ripped his finger and elongated it and like it tore oh. the bone and yeah, he had a bunch of, yeah, that's why I asked. Well, I just know I, the, the picture doesn't bother me. Just the thought, thought of that happening feels painful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question. So uh, I would say that, uh, again, in the healing process, that dent, that indentation should heal over. So that might still, it might not become quite flush again, but it should heal for the most part. It should heal over. All right. Excellent. All right. Uh, another type that is exclusively in adolescence uh, or young adults is an epiphyseal fracture. We actually talked about this already in class. If you guys remember, we were talking about how that epiphyseal, oops, wrong color, that epiphyseal plate is basically a weak spot between the epiphysis and the diaphysis because it is comprised of hyaline cartilage instead of bone. So a force at just the right or just the wrong uh, location could put stress on that epiphyseal plate and cause a displacement of the bone, breaking not so much the bone, but breaking the hyaline cartilage of the epiphyseal plate. And as we said, this is, especially in a younger individual, is a troubling type of fracture because the concern could be that during the healing process, the cartilage could completely ossify. And if it completely ossifies, then that growth plate closes. And now that long bone only has one growth plate instead of two. So it's gonna grow slower than the uh, one on the opposite side that has uh, two healthy growth plates. And so you can get some asymmetry in the lengths of the bones, right? This can obviously be troublesome uh, if it occurs in the arms, but it's even more troublesome if it occurs in the legs because in the legs, uh, it can affect the ability to uh, be able to have the appropriate and right gait. Yes, Eric. Actually, I thought uh, this, um, like breaking uh, epiphyseal um, bone will actually make those cells grow faster. And I thought uh, like it will 
uh, be longer than it's supposed to be? Like those cells that divide? So uh, it, I, I, I see what you're saying with that. You are correct in that uh, the, the tissue can grow back more quickly in that area. The concern is that when that tissue grows back, it's gonna grow back as bone. So once it grows back as bone, then it's no longer gonna be able to get any bigger as a result of that. So it may cause a slightly larger thickening of the tissue in that, but the overall effect of that is a closing of the growth plate so that the bone won't grow any longer at that location. So it heals as a bone cell, not, not as a cartilage? Well, see, as we'll see in the healing process, uh, as, we've, as we've learned, life is lazy. We know an easy way to make bone. We make cartilage and we replace that cartilage with bone. And guess what? That's exactly how the bones are going to heal. And so since there's already cartilage there, there is a risk that the uh, chemical signals, the growth factors, the things like that that stimulate the healing process can enhance the formation of bone and cause it to close prematurely. Yeah, so it might be a little thicker, but it would ultimately be shorter because it wouldn't be able to grow anymore in that location. I have a question regarding um, individuals who perhaps have like an elongated uh, leg. Um, I've heard of an instance where someone actually got the other leg shaved or like a part of their leg cut off to balance with the other. Is that an actual uh, procedure that actually happens or? I, I have not heard of that. I'm not going to say that it doesn't occur. I guess it would have to be the situation. What I've actually heard of is the opposite, where oh. what they do is they do a break in the bone. And when oh. they do a break in the bone, what they do is they then put a spacer in between there so that they, they break the bone and then they put a spacer in between it so that that space fills up with bone. And as a result of that, you could get an eighth, maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe, but closer to an eighth of an inch in length added to the bone by doing that. However, if you think about it, even if it's a quarter of an inch, if one leg is an inch and a half longer than the other, that's a lot of breaks, a lot of pain, a lot of time to have that done. But, but uh, so um, I've heard of that. I haven't heard of the other one. I'm not saying that it doesn't occur. This isn't my area of expertise, but I've heard more yeah, of the, the like, space um, or larger. Like, um, shoes that have like a larger platform for the other foot that's shorter. Yeah, that's much easier. Exactly. It's much easier yeah. to put in lifts in the shorter leg and get, you know, have orthopedic shoes than it is to, to cut or, uh, you know, or to break the bone. All right. Well, thank you. Okay, but the, the shaving in that case is more of uh, for the thickness of it from the healing process as opposed to the length. So yeah, orthopedic shoes is typically how they will. Uh... Again, I, I don't think there's a best or worst way to break a bone. There's it, it, a lot of it is the which bone we're involved in and, and what the bones, what the person does. I mean, there's a lot of things. There's no best or worst of these things. It's all personal preference. All right. The next one also is one that only happens in adolescence. And this is a type of fracture known as a green stick fracture. This refers to, right, like that young sapling tree. If you go camping for the weekend, because all the things we can do right now is just be outside and you want to make s'mores, do you all go up to that sapling uh, tree and grab one of its young branches and try to snap that off to be able to use that to make your s'mores? How easy is it to snap a branch off of a sapling? Easy. Really? Actually, no. Not easy. It's all bend. Just bend. Yeah, it bends. It, it bends and flexes. And if you keep bending and flexing, eventually it'll shred and then you can kind of tear it apart. But it doesn't just snap. And that's what happens with adolescent bones. As we talked about, remember our bones start much more collagenous. There's a much more collagen in them. And so they're a lot more flexible because of that. 
And that collagen and that flexibility allows them to resist some of the breaking forces. What happens is you put a force on the bone and that force on the bone causes the bone to start to break. But because of the uh, flexibility of the bone because of the large amount of, of collagen, what ends up happening on the distal side is that the matrix is actually able to compress. And as the matrix compresses, it is able to absorb the force of that and the break doesn't go all the way through. So typically this is just a partial break that occurs because of the flexibility of the bones. And much like that sapling's limb, you can sometimes get a shredding of the bone matrix on the broken side. So make sure you take out the garbage and no one will hit you in the head with a hammer, Yuli, and then you won't have to worry about it. All right. I can see where temporal bone would be bad because of all of the structures we have inside there for hearing and for balance. Erevek, did you have a question or is your hand still up from before? I don't remember. Oh, no, I don't have a question. Okay, I'll, I'll lower that then. Perfect. Excellent. All righty. So this type of green stick where the bone is flexible, the bone has that give, the bone doesn't break all the way across is again, our last major specific classification for fractures. All right, so however many that is, those are the, the, the categories you are responsible for. However, if we've learned anything, don't be too excited yet, Cody. If we've learned anything, it's that anatomists love to name everything. Yes, Cody, go ahead. I wanted to ask, where do uh, scaphoid fractures fall under this classification? I mean, it, it, it depends. I mean, bones can be broken in different ways. So um, I was talking specifically about the foosh, uh, the falling injury where your hand's outstretched and it cuts off the blood supply to the, bro the bone causing necrosis. Right. So it, well, it, again, in that case, it's typically one of the bones of the, um, of the wrist, the scaphoid bone of the wrist that you're talking about. And so that likely would be more of a uh, compression fracture would be my guess, although it could be, um, yeah, probably by my guess best that would be that because of the location of how that occurs. But again, you gotta be careful. Different falls can cause different types of fractures. And that's kind of the point I was getting to when we talk about, uh, and as you can see here from this list, there are certain types of fractures, lots of fractures actually, that anatomists have given special names to. And I'll just point out a couple of them. Uh, the first of this is what is known as the Coles fracture. A Coles fracture, again, if we were going to be precise in our definition of this, as you can see here from this illustration, is a break of the radius always and sometimes the ulna um, at, or let's say it this way, near the distal epiphysis. from catching yourself during a fall. All right, so basically you get tripped, you put your hands out to catch yourself, and as you put your hands out to catch yourself, you get this transverse fracture of the, um, of the radius near the distal epiphysis that sometimes can involve the ulna, but doesn't have to involve the ulna. Uh, from catching yourself in the fall. That particular type of fracture, they call a Coles fracture. And we see that nicely in the illustration here. So notice that one doesn't involve the scaphoid, but you can, in catching yourself falling, also break the wrist bones. And since we're here looking at it, uh, the scaphoid would be this kind of half moon shaped bone right there that could also be damaged uh, from a fall. But that would be a different type of fracture. That would not be considered a Coles fracture. And I don't know what that one is called particularly. However, my favorite named uh, fracture is what is known as a POTS fracture. A POTS fracture is, and again, we want to be uh, specific in its definition, it's a spiral fracture of, in this case, both the tibia 
and fibula. And again, the location is similar near the distal epiphysis. This is typically caused by a twisting or a turning of a foot. Uh, like for instance, if you step in a gopher hole and get it twisted that way, or in the case that it originally occurred, and again, obviously he wasn't the original person that this happened to, but there was a physician by the name of Potts, good old Bob Potts, was walking down the street talking to a friend. And as he was talking to a friend and he wasn't paying attention, he stepped on the edge of the curb. And as he stepped on the edge of the curb, it twisted his foot, broke his tibia and fibia distally right above the ankle. And as he laid there writhing in pain, he thought, hey, it would be really great to write this up for a medical journal. And that's what he did. And they named it after him. So he broke his leg out on a walk. And as a result of that, wrote it up and got his name, get it named after him, which I find hilarious. All right. Uh, professor. Yes. So where does um, like a dislocation of a like, like when I was in elementary school, I dislocated my elbow. So it wasn't all the way broken, but then I still had to have surgery because my bones were so small that it couldn't put it back in place. So where does that fall under? So in that case, again, that's not a fracture because what hasn't they haven't actually broken the bone. What's happened is that the bones come together. There is the joint where the bone comes together. And what happens is instead of taking a single bone and breaking it into two pieces, you have two bones that are forming a joint and they are displaced from each other. And again, okay. in an older, in, in a more mature body, sometimes that can be shoved back into place, right? But if you were really young, then it was something that obviously had to, they had to go in and, uh, and surgically fix. And sometimes they have to surgically do that in uh, adults as well. Sometimes the bone can be broken during that dislocation, but doesn't have to be. So if the bone wasn't broken, then you're just dislocating the joint. Okay, that makes sense. All right. Awesome. I like your guys' enthusiasm with this topic. This is fun. I have a That's question a, too. Yes. Um, so isn't sometimes it's not so much the, the fracture that causes a ton of pain and forever healing process. Isn't it sometimes also torn ligaments and tendons and stuff like that, that can heal a lot slower than bone because it's not as vascularized and that could be potentially a, a, you know, a sore thing for the rest of your life? Absolutely. So you are correct. As we've talked about, bone itself is fairly dynamic and heals fairly rapidly, but you are correct. Uh, it, it, and again, this is a generalization, but typically I, I, I think what I like to think of this in terms of is sports, because sports is one of those places where you hear about these things the most. If someone breaks their femur, the largest bone in their body, they're maybe out six, eight weeks. Right? Whereas if someone tears their anterior cruciate ligament or their Achilles ligament or something like that, they could be out for closer to one to two years. So yes, absolutely, different tissues heal at different rates. And the more peripheral damage there is to a fracture, the more likely there could be long, it could take longer to heal and have more long-term implications, especially, and we haven't even talked about it yet, although Cody did a good job of bringing it up, uh, when vascularization is involved when you're restricting or, or, or stopping blood flow to other parts of the body, then that dramatically can increase the, the complexity of the injury and the healing process from that as well. All right. And if you don't want your brains to spill out, then just make sure you wear a helmet when you uh, rollerblade and ice skate and, and uh, use your longboard and all those fun things. All right, so as you guys have hinted at, there are lots of different types of fractures. And obviously different fractures will heal in slightly different ways. However, in this class, the sky is blue. So we are gonna talk about in general, how a bone would repair. And to do that, we'll do that with the simplest example and that would be in a transverse fracture. All right, so let's talk about this. And like we usually do with the processes, let's draw this first. So I've got this fine bone here, although actually it's so easy to draw. Let's go ahead and start from scratch. Do, do, do. Nope. 
All right, there's the diaphysis of my long bone. And we get a transverse fracture. Now, when we break a bone, we know that bone is gonna hurt like heck. But what else is gonna happen when we break that bone? We're gonna damage nerves. And so obviously uh, it's gonna be painful. We're gonna be aware of it. But what else happens? Bleeding, absolutely. We are going to get the breaking of blood vessels. Breaking of tissues? Yeah, we'll damage surrounding tissues as well. And again, let's, oh, we forgot to do that for our bone. Let's not forget that our bone has its periosteum on the outer surface that could or could not be damaged in this process. But we'll go ahead and put that on there. And of course, as we know, I'm gonna cheat and pull it away a little bit. We know that inside of it, it houses those mesenchymal cells. So again, throw some quick labels on here. Oops, no. The periosteum and mesenchymal cells. Excellent. So absolutely. So we're going to damage nerves. We're going to break blood vessels. And so what's going to happen is we get this large swelling of blood in the area. Of course, we have a fancy name for a big swelling of blood. What's the fancy name we give for a big swelling of blood? Hematoma. Hematoma, exactly. And that's the key. In this first stage, what happens is the formation of a hematoma. So we get this big, huge swelling of blood within this area, right? Bringing white blood cells to the area uh, to help us to protect us from any kind of defense. And like I said, oops, I didn't want that capitalized. Uh, oops, blood cells. Trying to talk, trying to draw, trying to uh, write all at the same time. It's not easy. Swelling, pain in the area. Why is that pain so important? To so make signal reactions. Signal to know that something's wrong. Yeah, so that you know that something's wrong. If you were going to go jogging five miles after class today, but during the middle of class you broke your leg and it was super painful, are you going to be likely to go jogging five miles? No. Yeah. <laughs> well, some people are glutton for punishments, but most of us, the pain would stop us from wanting to do that. And so again, it makes us aware of the fact that we're injured so that we don't want to do anything to uh, further damage or cause any further problems from it. So we get that swelling, we get the, the inflammation in that area. We have one other issue with this breaking of the blood vessels. When we break the blood vessels, as we talked about, this is going to disrupt blood flow. So yes, the portion of the bone that has been damaged obviously is damaged as a result of that. But if we break the blood vessel, for instance, feeding the cells in this region of the bone, well, then this region of the bone could die as well, right? Or this part over here could be disrupted from its blood flow. So what can happen is we can also get peripheral bone that is damaged from the lack of blood supply. So we're going to get some bone death outside of where the actual injury occurs as a result of this. Yes, Laura. Um, so the formation of a hematoma, like you said, is because of the, um, the fracture. Can it occur in a sprain or is it just always well, going? So great question. So in this case, we have broken the bone when we have broken the bone that ruptures blood vessels. 
And so we will get swelling and hematoma in that area. However, is it possible to injure a muscle, tear a muscle, injure some other part of your body that also could swell and get cause, you know, blood to fill in that area and cause a hematoma not involving the bone? Yes, that can happen in other areas as well. So it is possible to get hematomas in other areas. But this particular hematoma is due because of the bursting of the blood vessels within the bone itself, because we know bone is very, very vascularized. But yeah, you can get hematomas lots of different locations. I missed it. What was the purple stuff you drew right at the bone fracture? Uh, this stuff? Yes. Uh, that represents the, it really looks purple. I thought it was, it's the gray actually. This is dead bone. That is cool. This is just representing the dead bone uh, that is uh, forming uh, from the disruption of the blood supply. So the point I was trying to make is that even some of the bone that isn't directly injured by the fracture, damaged by the fracture, can actually die from that disruption of blood flow to the area. All right. Questions on that? All right. So we have this injury. But luckily, we have this periosteum that has mesenchymal cells. And as we know, mesenchymal cells are pluripotent stem cells that can divide to become any type of cell uh, that is going to be needed for a connective tissue. And since we've broken this bone right here, these mesenchymal cells are going to divide so that we can heal this bone. And we're gonna heal this bone by type producing what types of, uh, of connective tissue cells? Fibrocartilage. Osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are what would make a whole lot of sense, but as it turns out, what they actually divide to form are fibroblasts and chondroblasts. I know that doesn't seem intuitive. No, remember mesenchymal cells are pluripotent, not omnipotent. Omnipotent means they could become anything and they can't become skin cells, for instance, right, or liver cells. Whereas unipotent means that they can only become one thing. So pluripotent means that they can divide to become multiple things. And in this case, they can become any cell associated with a connective tissue. We would think that would be osteoblasts, but instead it forms fibroblasts and chondroblasts. Now, of course, what do fibroblasts do? Make fibers. Make fibers. Fibroblasts, which make fibers, excellent. And what do chondroblasts do? Make cartilage. Make cartilage, absolutely. And so what happens is this area fill, fills with a cartilage that has a massive amount of collagen fibers. These two cells together, types of cells together, make a chunk of fibrocartilage that we call the, the cartilaginous cap, the fibrocartilaginous cap. Alice, or it's also called a cap. So what's going to happen is this area, I'll cheat, is going to fill up with this massive amount of collagen fibers, massive amount of cartilage to form this big, whole, huge fibrocartilaginous callus or cap. And this process can occur in as little as a few hours. Oops, that didn't all need to be capitalized, but. Right. Why is that significant? Because quick if it's not straight and it starts to heal, it'll heal crooked. There you go, absolutely. There you are on Sunday, right? Playing flag football with your friends. And of course, Sunday's flag football with your friends basically means tackle. 
and you hurt your arm, right? But you got to be big and manly so you can't say anything about it. And then Tuesday rolls around and your arm still hurts. So finally you go and see the doctor. And when you go and see the doctor, it turns out it's broken. And often in those types of situations, what's the first thing the doctor has to do? Rebreak it. Yeah, break the bone, right? Really when they're rebreaking it, when they're breaking the bone, they're not actually breaking the bone what they're doing is breaking up this chunk of fiber cartilage. And that's what the fiber cartilaginous callus is. This callus or cap is this chunk of fiber cartilage. And so if the bones aren't aligned, they will have to break up that fiber cartilage and realign it. So the bones, so that when that cap forms, it forms the basis for which the growth is going to occur. All right, and yes, that's what the fibroblasts and the chondroblasts make. They make a big chunk of fibrocartilage called the fibrocartilaginous callus or fibrocartilaginous cap. Of course, once we have cartilage here, luckily we know how to convert cartilage into bone and that's exactly what's gonna happen. We have to convert this cartilage into bone. And luckily we know exactly how that's gonna happen. A blood vessel grows into the area, changing the chemical signals. We start to produce osteoblasts, which of course are going to make bone matrix. And osteoclasts, which are gonna break down the dead bone and the uh, fibrocartilage. And so what happens is that we start the process of using those osteoblasts to break down, oops, okay, that wasn't, that was a mistake. There we go. Uh, we use, I'll just cheat and do it that way, that osteoblast to break down the dead bone the fibrocartilage, and then we are going to use those osteoblasts to replace all of this with new bones. So some of it went there, and some of it went there, and some of it went there, and all in between. And we get this big, huge chunk. Now, when we're making this big, huge chunk of bone in here, do you think it's going to be precisely arranged, perfectly aligned osteons and compact bones? No. 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 So what happens is we produce this huge chunk of spongy bone that fills the space. And when that big, huge chunk of spongy bone fills the space, we call this the bony callus or the bony cap. Now, at this point, is the bone healed? No. 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 But typically, at this point, the cast comes off. Why? Why are we taking the cast off at this point if the bone's not fully healed? Because the bone needs to strengthen. Right. Because as we know, weight bearing exercise strengthens the bone. So at this point, the bone can take a moderate amount of stress. And in this case, that stress is going to be a good thing. So again, the second that cast comes off, you shouldn't go running five miles like you were going to before. But as Yulia pointed out, you want to put weight on it. You want to start walking around on it. You want to start putting that force on it so that that force can start to strengthen the bone and align the osteons. Yeah, that's where the physical therapy comes in. Laura, you had a question. Um, in a bone that can't really have like a cast or like your nose. So it when it you break it, is it always, it's going to be fibrocartilage callus instead of um, the um, 
what is it? The bony callus? No, so, okay, so be careful because a lot of times when people break their nose, what actually happens is they break the cartilage of the ridge. Remember, oh, okay. our nasal bone is up here and this nasal bone does help to form the bridge of the nose. But normally mm -hmm. when someone breaks their nose, it's typically more inferiorly in the cartilage. But okay. you do have the right idea. If, for instance, you know, you, you have a, a, a fracture to the skull or something like that, obviously you're not putting weight bearing exercise on it. Uh, but at the same time, it's also not weight bearing, right? Whereas if it's your leg, having that, that stress on it, that moderate stress on it does help to strengthen it and realign it so that it can, um, so that it can uh, hold your weight and help you to move around. Is this whole process calcis, calcis, oh my goodness, Lord, calcification, or is it this, the strengthening of the spongy bone? Well, remember, calcification is the formation of bone. So I would say, yes, this third sta stage where we're forming the bony callus would be the, the calcification part where we are, you know, the, the chondrocytes are enlarging, they're dying, the blood vessels grow in, we um, deposit the, the, uh, the hydroxyapatite crystals, we're making the bone. So yes, I would say that this part, stage three, is where we're actually making the bone. But as we've hinted at, this is not what we want the final bone to look like. So we still require remodeling of the bone. Again, using that stress, using the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts, we are going to make the bone look like it did before. We will hollow out the medullary cavity. All right, so our osteoclasts will get in here. And as our osteoclasts get in here, they will help to hollow back out our medullary cavity so that it can fill with marrow again, right? Uh, we will align the outer surface. Uh, with compact bone. So we will form those thick layers of compact bone on the outer surface. So we're gonna get that nice thick compact bone on the outer surface, All right? Hollow out the medullary cavity and heal the bone. Now this process, give me one second, Sydney. I have one more statement and then I'll answer your question. This process, uh, well, if it's a mature adult then it would still be yellow bone marrow. Oh, well, actually that's not entirely true. It would start as red, but then would be converted into yellow. Um, this process can take months to years to fully remodel. However, typically, and again, there's always gonna be exceptions. Typically the bone is stronger after healing than it was before. So when a bone is broken, that bone is actually much more likely to be broken in a second different location than it was on this original location. And after years, five, 10 years, the outer surface of the bone, it may be impossible to tell that it's been broken. For fractures that are like 10 years old of, in the arms and legs, it typically takes a x-ray because what'll happen on the x-ray, what you'll actually see is that in the x-ray, typically the cortex, the compact bone, it's not the cortex, but the compact bone is typically thicker in an area where a fracture was than in the surrounding regions. So in the surrounding region, the cortex may be, look like this. So from the outside, it all looks smooth and continuous, but at the side where a break is, typically it is thicker. And that's why typically it is stronger. Now, Sydney, you had a question? So in somebody who, like I had a family member who had a, a fracture right at the head of their femur and due to the way that their body was, their body works, uh, it wasn't healing correctly. And so they had a rod placed down their femur to stimulate bone growth. How does, how, like having a rod placed in your femur, how does, I don't really know what my question is, but uh, so just thinking about like hollowing out that medullary cavity, it just seems like almost counterintuitive, I guess. 
Well, so so here, here's what I would say about that. Remember, the medullary cavity in a, an adult contains yellow bone marrow, which is primarily adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. So as far as, you know, if you were to remove it, you're not dramatically changing the person's ability to make blood cells or anything like that. So it wouldn't impact things that way. Mm -hmm. Putting the rod down the center definitely would help to stabilize it because again, the hip uh, is definitely a, a weight bearing structure. And because of the shape of the femur, it can be challenging to, to, to stabilize it and allow it to heal. As to why that would stimulate bone growth, that I don't have a good answer to. Uh, yeah. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Maybe they coat it with something that helps to encourage uh, the depositing of uh, bone matrix on it. So maybe they have something like that that's on it, or maybe it's just more of a factor by if they can stabilize it, then it's not moving. If it's not moving, then it's more likely to form these calluses and be able to heal. So maybe it's something like that. But uh, off the top of my head, I have not heard of that before, but I could see a couple ways where that might be advantageous. Okay. Uh, no, eventually the bony callus will go away. And uh, again, you'll hollow out the medullary cavity. You'll just have thicker compact bone as a result of that final uh, remodeling. So again, I've done a, uh, an okay job of showing this, but let's look at the pretty pictures from your textbook and see how this works. So again, notice just like I drew, although a little bit better, uh, you can see we have this transverse fracture of the bone disrupting the blood supply and so it fills with blood. Notice our periosteum is still intact, but even if it was torn, there'd still be some periosteum left to help to facilitate the healing process. So the first thing that happens when the bone breaks is we get this fracture hematoma, All right? The blood vessels burst, we get swelling of blood in the area, and because we're disrupting the blood supply, remember there's a dead bone that can form in the area, not just from the injury, but from the lack of the blood supply to it. And not only are we bursting blood vessels, but we're irritating uh, those nerves, causing it to become painful and swollen, making us aware that we have an injury so that we protect it and so that we get it taken care of. Those chemicals released from the damaged tissues, those chemicals released from the white blood vessels that come into the area, stimulate the mesenchymal cells of the periosteum to become active. But as we talked about, they don't become what we think they should become. Instead, they become fibroblasts that make a lot of fibers and chondroblasts that make cartilage. And so the space fills up with this big, huge chunk of cartilage with a massive numbers of, of, of uh, collagen fibers in it. Essentially, it forms a big chunk of fibrocartilage. And that big chunk of fibrocartilage, we call the fibrocartilaginous callus, or like I said, it also can be called the fibrocartilaginous cap. And so this stabilizes the bones. And then this forms the framework where we can grow bone to replace what has been injured. As we also talked about, the formation of this cartilage can happen in as little as a couple hours. So if those two pieces of bone aren't perfectly aligned, then the doctor actually has to break up the fiber cartilage, right? You hear about that all the time. They had to re-break my bone. They're not really breaking the bone. What they're doing is breaking up this fibrocartilage so that the bone can be aligned properly so that when it replaces it with bone, it heals. If you leave it displaced and it heals that way, then you're going to lose the integrity of the bone, right? And it can affect the movement of the bone, the strength of the bone, all sorts of problems. So it's very important to get those two pieces aligned. Yep, exactly. Next time someone tells you they rebroke their arm, yes, you call them out. Tell them, nope, they broke your cartilage, not your bone. Excellent. Once, um, once that fibrocartilaginous cap forms, then, as we know, we can replace 
that cartilage with bone. And that's exactly what's gonna happen. Blood vessels grow into the area. They bring those osteoblasts and those osteoclasts, the chemical signals. We start breaking down the fiber cartilage. We start breaking down the dead bone. And we replace it all by a big, huge chunk of spongy bone. Right? Again, this isn't what we ultimately want the bone to look like, but this big chunk of spongy bone stabilizes the bone and now the bone can handle a little bit of stress. So this is typically the point where our cast comes off. Because now we've got bone holding the two pieces of bone together. Again, you're not gonna be able to run that Iron Man, but you can walk around the block. And walking around the block is a good thing because that stress on the bone is going to help us in the remodeling process. Those osteoblasts and osteoclasts stay active, hollowing out the medullary cavity, thickening the, co uh, the compact bone on the outer surface. He said, this part can take months to years depending on how severe and the type of injury that occurs. But typically at the end of this, a big, huge chunk of compact bone is all that is left. And because of this, typically the bone is as strong or even stronger than it was before. Now, again, we are generalizing this here with just the transverse fracture in the middle of the bone. Bones that happen at pressure points like the head of the femur, or the head of the humerus, things along those lines, uh, it, it can, have continued complications from that, as someone was mentioning with the, with the hip issue. Uh, but again, we're, we're kind of broad stroking in generalizations of how this process occurs. Again, it's gonna be slightly different for all different types of breaks, but it, these four steps are the main process for uh, healing and repairing a bone. All right, questions on that? Let me go ahead and I forgot to save this. So let me do that before I forget. Not that I think you necessarily need this picture, but just in case. Oops. All right. Any questions now on how we break or repair a bone? All right. Excellent. Uh, so then here's what we're going to do. We are going to, we are done with our bone physiology. Uh, sure, we can do that. What's your question about stress fractures? I guess just curious, like which one of the categories that would fall into? So stress fractures are really their own type of fracture in most cases. And let's cheat and actually go back to the original picture. Typically a stress fracture would probably be closest associated with the green stick although you don't necessarily get the shredding of it, what typically happens with a stress fracture is that continuous stress from, you know, continuous activity like running or something along those lines, the impact on the bone can cause a partial transverse fracture where you get these small little micro fractures that typically don't go all the way through the bone but these small little micro fractures can occur as you're damaging uh, the matrix with the impact, but not fully and completely breaking them apart. So it's kind, oh, of, it's kind of a cross between a transverse and a green stick. It's not because the, the bones are necessarily more collagenous, right? That isn't why it's kind of like car, green stick. I just mean that it doesn't go all the way through by that, but that's typically uh, when they talk about a stress fracture, what they're talking about, little minor breaks that typically don't go all the way through the bone. From so the stress impact. fractures can um, happen over time? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Great questions. You guys have been really uh, active in this one. I like this. This is apparently one that you guys enjoyed. That's cool. All right. Excellent. So what we'll do, let's actually do this. Close that. That and we're getting closer to the exam. Ah, that motivates as well. I do understand and appreciate that. Perfect. So with that, we are done. So what we are going to talk about after the break the answers for the test. 
Well, yes, we will. Everything we talk about in class is a potential answer for the class, the test. When we come back, we will talk about our articulations. We will talk about joints. So let's go ahead and take our break. We'll take a 15 minute break. It looks like it's 120 now. So let's restart at uh, 135. And we will pick up the lecture and start the recording from there. All right, questions on that? All right, I'll see you guys in 15 minutes. As I mentioned before, uh, I think from past history, this is one of the areas where people struggle the most, not in this section, not because I think it's particularly hard, but I think part of the challenge is the vocabulary. Um, they're more alphabet soup type words. And like we see here, there are often multiple words that mean the exact same thing. And this is the perfect example. When we talk about a joint, we are talking about a connection between two bones, where two bones come together. But that point where two bones come together is not just called a joint, but it is also called an articulation, or it is also referred to as an arthrosis. All three of those terms mean the exact same thing. It means, <clears throat> you know, the connection between two bones. And really the key is that when two bones are come together, they come together by some type of typically flexible connective tissue that holds them together. Their functions, of course, are to hold the bones together, but do them in a way that allows for flexibility of movement. Of course, the study of joints is the field of arthrology <clears throat> and the study of the movement of the body that these joints allow is the field of kinesiology. All right, now, when we talk about joints, like we talked about glands, like we talk about a lot of things, there are two ways that we can classify them. We can classify them by basically how they're made or, oh, this doesn't have to be that huge anymore, or we can classify them by the amount and type of movement they allow. In other words, we can classify them structurally and functionally, all right? Structure and function are things that we know go hand in hand, and absolutely these are gonna be related to each other, but when we talk about our joints, <clears throat> we can do them functionally. And when we do it functionally, this is by the degree of movement that they allow. Now let's go to the whiteboard. You're uh, obviously, let's do this. Here, let's go to the whiteboard and start here. So there are two classifications for <clears throat> joints. And not surprisingly, those two classifications are related to each other. On Canvas, I have actually posted a handout that basically does exactly what I'm gonna do right here, puts this all together and hopefully helps to make sense of it. There is no assignment associated with it. I just want you to uh, be able to appreciate and aware how these things are related. And that's probably good there. So is it, is it the knee joint um, handout or is it something else? Something else. The knee joint is definitely something we're going to need to talk about. You want, That is going to be the one main joint you're responsible for. No. Uh, here, hold on. Since I mentioned it, let's look. There is a handout uh, under the joint classifications help. So at the bottom of the, the last thing in the lab handouts portion is the joints classification handout. So that's basically what I'm recreating here essentially. <clears throat> so the first way we can classify joints is functional classification. With the functional classification, basically it is the degree 
of movement the joint allows. And the important thing to remember is that there are three specific types. Well, let's just say it this way, three types. I knew it wasn't that simple. I knew there wasn't two. Well, no, there are three types of functional classifications. No, I know, I'm saying, I'm saying it, get, it gets more and more deep. <laughs> Excellent. So the first functional classification is what we call a sin arthrosis. So, as mentioned, it's an alphabet soup word, but remember arthrosis means joint. Does anybody know what sin refers to? S-I-N like that? Together. Sort of same or, 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 or together. You guys kind of have the right idea. Uh, sometimes it means no, like in syntax, things along those lines. But <clears throat> with a sin arthrosis, basically this is a joint that allows no movement. So there's no movement uh, that occurs in a synarthrosis. Can someone give me an example of where we might find one of those? Where do we have two bones held together where we don't have any movement? Like Oops. tibia and fibia? Well, but there would they actually do move. Yeah, they rotate. Yep, they can rotate a little bit. Would it be our um, what is it called? Our ribs? Uh, no, not the ribs either. Because remember, our thoracic cavity needs to be able to change shape. There you go. Daniel's got. How about our skull? Are the bones of our skull moving in relation to each other? No. So those would be an example of a synarthrosis, right? Where there's no movement that is allowed. The second type is an amphiarthrosis. Again, arthrosis means joint. When I say amphi, what do you guys think of? Oops. What does amphi make you think of? Amphibian. Amphibian. And what's special about amphibian? They're not reptiles. They're not reptiles, right? And, and uh, where do amphibians live? Don't they in, in water? A, a mix of 100% of their life in the water? It's, I, I think, think it's they can be. environment where it's both on land and water. Yeah, they spend time both on land and on water. So amphi kind of means in between, right? And that's what an amphiarthrosis is. This is a joint uh, that allows limited or restricted movement. Uh, an example of this would be, remember we were talking about, uh, or we'll talk about it in more depth, uh, the pubic symphysis, the pelvis, when the pelvis comes together, there's that joint in the front that allows a little bit of flexibility of movement. This typically is loosened by hormones when a female is pregnant, making it easier for her to pass the basketball through. Right, So it gives a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more uh, give. It doesn't swing like a gate open, Right, but it does loosen, giving you know a pregnant woman, especially a late-term pregnant woman, a very distinctive gait to the way she walks. Right, notice I didn't say waddle, right, but that very distinctive gait because of that flexibility that gives there. Someone earlier used the example of the tibia and fibia, how they can kind of uh, move in relation to each other. That would be another example of one of these amphiarthroses. Yulia, yes. Yeah. So I still don't know why it's called amphiarthrosis. Because it's not a free moving joint, but it's also a not moving joint, right? So it doesn't allow no movement. It doesn't allow free movement. So it's basically in between the two. Okay, thank you. Yep. And that leads us right into the third one. The third one is a diarthrosis. And that diarthrosis allows, is a joint, I want to be consistent with the way I've done it that allows free range of motion. However, 
It's not a completely free range. It can be restricted in the axis, right? Perfect example is right here between my first two uh, uh, phalanges of my fingers, right? At there, I have that ability, or actually I guess here is easier. I have that ability to be able to move. I have a free range of motion forward and back like this here. However, can I get my finger and move it to the side this way? Not typically. No. no, not typically. And in fact, if I did that, I'd probably be heading to the doctor shortly afterwards, right? So notice it's only along one plane of section, just moving up and down this way. Whereas in this joint here, uh, between my phalanges and my metacarpals, not only can I go forward and back, but I can also go left and right as well. So notice this joint allows two axes of movement, whereas this joint only allows one axis of movement. So both of those are diarthroses. They allow a free range of motion, but some can do it on one or uh, others can do it on more than one axis of motion. I have a quick question. Yes. What was the example of amphiarthrosis that you gave us? The pubic symphysis uh, uh, in your pelvis where the, the two pubic bones come together. So right in the front, uh, the pubic symphysis, which becomes flexible in a female and who's pregnant. It's flexible in everybody, but it becomes more flexible in a, in a pregnant female. Okay, thank you. And then I have one more quick question. So people who are super flexible, do they improve their joint, um, what the joint gives yeah. movement, or is that different? Typically, uh, the increase in flexibility has more to do with the ligaments and tendons that are supporting them. Typically, having looser or more stretched out ligaments and tendons that give them more range of motion. Yep. Uh, yes, Ariel, uh, our shoulder, not only is it a diarthrosis, but it is a multi axial. Not only can it go left and right, not only can it go up and down, but it can go at all sorts of angles in between. And can also rotate. So yeah, it is definitely a diarthrosis. In fact, it is our most uh, a free moving, free range of motion joint that we have in the body, our shoulder. Sad? Oh, there you go, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis. There you go, that makes sense. Excellent. All right, so those are our functional classifications. Questions on that? All right, that was pretty easy. So next we need to talk about uh, yes, somewhat because uh, yeah, that is one of the good things about it is that it has a wide range of motion, but that also means it is the joint that is most likely to be dislocated. And obviously, especially a pitcher in baseball puts a tremendous amount of force and stress on their shoulder. Uh, so yes, that can be uh, one of the reasons why they uh, uh, shoulder and elbow injuries uh, are not uncommon in baseball players because of the amount of force that they're producing. All right. The second classification for joints are our structural classifications. With our structural classifications, basically what we are defining here is the type of connective tissue that holds the bones together and if there is a cavity, a present or not. So basically, actually let's do it this way. Our structural classification is essentially how the joint is made. And what we're looking for is what type of connective tissue holds the bones together, and if there is a joint cavity that is present or not. And uh, for our structural classifications, there are four types. So let's identify them, thinking of terms of what type of connective tissue it is that holds them together. Now, the first one is what we call a synostosis. 
Now, based on that name, you may not be able to tell what type of connective tissue is holding the two bones together. However, I will give you a term that I will tell you right now you are not allowed to use on the exam, but it will help us in our definition here. Synostoses, is, is is the singular, es is the plural, ic is the adjective, fun with vocabulary. I'm actually gonna write that down because that's, but we'll do that in a second. Synostoses are sometimes commonly, but not by you, referred to as bony joints. So based on that, what type of connective tissue do you think holds a joint together, the two bones together in a synostosis? Like a fibrous connective tissue? Well, it's called a bony joint commonly. So what kind of connective tissue do you think holds it together? Bone connective. Connect bone connective bone. tissue. There you go. By bone connective tissue. All right. So a synostosis has bone connective tissue that basically holds the two bones together. Now, again, let me put this up here because it helps. No, no, that I want black. This I want green. So remember, as I mentioned, SIS is the singular. SES is the plural. And SIC is the adjective. So I can have one synostosis, I could have two synostoses, or I could have a joint that is synostosic, right? Same thing for amphiarthrosis or diarthrosis. One diarthrosis, two diarthroses, or my shoulder joint is diarthritic. All right. What's the term we're not allowed to use? Bony. Bony. Right. We put it there only to help us figure out what type of joint a synostosis was, but we're not going to use that term. You have to use the term synostosis. You will not even get partial credit if you use the term bony. I'm telling you right now, you will get it wrong. What if we put synostosis and then bony in parentheses? That would be 100% correct. That I would be fine with. <clears throat> Just to be clear, like you won't use bony either. I won't um, use bony. In a question. Either. That is correct. I will not use bony either. Correct. All right. The good news is it does get easier from here. The second type is a fibrous joint. With a fibrous joint, guess what kind of connective tissue is holding it together? Fiber. There you go. A fibrous connective tissue holds the two bones together. Excellent. We have cartilaginous. And with a cartilaginous joint, guess what kind of connective tissue holds the two bones together? Yes, Yulia? Did we have examples um, of- We'll get to that. Don't worry okay. about it. We'll get to that. Okay. Cartilage, there you go. So cartilaginous uh, joint, we have the cartilage connective tissue holding the two bones together. And the fourth type is one you should be familiar with, a synovial joint, right? With the synovial joint, remember we talked about synovial joints when we talked about <clears throat> synovial membranes. So a synovial joint is the only joint that has a joint cavity, right? So the others don't have a joint cavity. And with the synovial joint, that cavity 
is surrounded by a synovial membrane. And what did that synovial membrane do again? Make fluid and... Yeah, it made synovial fluid, right? And that synovial fluid basically uh, played an important role in lubricating that joint and fun things like that. All right. Questions on that? Again, it's just going to get worse from here. So if this doesn't make sense, let me know now. I want examples for all of them. Okay, we're getting there. I promise you we're getting there. But before we can get to examples, there's one more piece of information we need to add to this. With our structural classifications, most structural classifications, I want this to be red, have what we call specific types. And so we need to identify those specific types. And not only do we need to know those specific types, but as we also talked about, do we think that there is a relationship between the structure and the function? Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is a trick question and anatomists hate us. It's not a trick question. There absolutely is going to be a relationship between them. Yep, absolutely. So I need a little more space here. So sneak that up, sneak that up, sneak that up, sneak that up, and then that fits. Excellent. So let's start easy. A synostosis, where we have a piece of bone connective tissue holding two bones together. Do you think which of our three functional classifications do you think our synostosis would be? Arthrosis. Arthrosis. Yeah, synarthrosis, absolutely. So all synostoses are synarthroses. All right, see how fun that is to say? Like you guys were talking about, while you're talking to grandma, tell her that too. She'll be incredibly impressed. Guess what, grandma? All synostoses are synarthritic. And she'll ooh and ah over that. Excellent. For our fibrous joints, there are three specific types. The first specific type is what is known as a suture. A suture, of course, is a joint where a fibrous connective tissue holds the bones together. But which bones are held together in a suture? The skull. Skull, absolutely. These are found in the skull only, where we have a fibrous connective tissue that basically knits the bones together. And because we know it is going to relate to the function, what do you think the functional classification of a suture is. Oops. What is the functional classification of a suture? Synarthrosis. Synarthrosis. There we go. The second specific type of fibrous joint is what we call a syndesmosis. A syndesmosis is basically where we have, Yuli, did you have a question or was that from before? I know you want your examples. I promise you I'm gonna give you examples of all of those. Before, did I'm sorry. Have, did you have another question? No, that was from before, I'm sorry, I'll lower okay, it. Okay, no problem, no, I can do that too. I just, I wasn't sure if I, cause I didn't lower that before. I wasn't sure if I hadn't done it or if you had another question. Sometimes <laughs> I don't see it when it comes up. All right. Um, and like I said, after we fill out this chart, we'll go through this all again and we'll look at the pretty pictures and we'll talk about examples and do all of that. But I want to do this on our chart first. A syndesmosis is basically where we have what we call an interosseous 
membrane, which again is another big fancy word, but it's a membrane. It's a sheet of fibers between two bones. Interosseous just means between two bones. So basically we have a sheet of connective tissue between the two bones, holding the two bones together. An example of this is the example that people were talking about earlier about the tibia and the fibia, but also between the radius and the ulna. We have these two parallel bones in our forearm, the radius and the ulna. Now, can my radius swing up and down away from my ulna? No. no. Do they have the ability to maybe flex closer to each other or twist in relation to each other? Yeah. And so that holding those two together, that membrane that holds those two together is an interosseous membrane and is a syndesmosis. And as hopefully I just gave it away, based on that, what would the functional classification of a syndesmosis be? Amphiarthrosis. Amphiarthrosis. Excellent. Our third specific type of fibrous joint is my favorite to say, it is a gomphosis. A gomphosis is actually another like suture, unique joint found in just one location. It is actually the joint that forms between the tooth and the either maxilla or mandible. Now, if you remember correctly, when we talked about the axial skeleton, the teeth aren't bones. They do not have the anatomy of the bones, but they are bone-like, primarily because they have those same hydroxyapatite crystals on their outer surface. So in our jaw, in our mandible or our maxilla, we have a hole in that bone. And in that hole sits the tooth, which is a bone-like structure. And then what we have is this, uh, this uh, fibrous connective tissue that's actually called the periodontal ligament. And that periodontal ligament holds the tooth in place inside of the bone. And so this joint we call a gumphosis. So like the suture only found in the skull, sutures of the gumphosis, I mean, probably not the, the joint of the gumphosis is only found associated with the teeth. And if you're not certain, you can grab one of your teeth and try to wiggle it. How much movement should you have between your teeth and your jaw? Barely any. None. So what would the functional classification of a gomphosis be? Synarthrosis. Synarthrosis. See how easy this is? Excellent. Perfect. Questions on those three specific types of fibrous joints? Um, just one. So, um, so we're born with, or, or so like as a child, we have our um, teeth and then we lose them and then they, we grow on our adult teeth. Mm -hmm. Would it still be synarthrosis? Well, yeah, it's synarthrosis, but the reason why it's not diarthrosis is because once they're fully grown, the, it just allows no movement. Okay, or... I see where you're going with this. So you have the right idea. Uh, our, our, our baby teeth, our deciduous teeth mm -hmm. do come out. However, what you got to remember what's happening there is that the mature tooth is growing up underneath. And as that mature tooth is growing up underneath, what happens is it breaks down the root of the baby tooth and it breaks down the fibrous connective tissue that's holding it in place, making it loose, making it wobbly, making it fall out. Mm -hmm. So it falls out because basically the adult tooth that is growing up destroys the joint, destroys the connection, and the tooth falls out. Gotcha, okay. Yep. Excellent. All right. Any other questions on our fibrous joints? 
All right. How many different types of cartilage do we have? Three. What are they? Elastic cartilage, fibrous cartilage, and hyaline. That's what hyaline. they are. There you go, hyaline cartilage. Excellent. So when we were making a joint with cartilage, would we necessarily want to use elastic cartilage? We would, would you want to use the cartilage that's in your ear to hold two bones together? No. Probably no. not, exactly. So not surprisingly, we only have two specific types hmm. of cartilaginous joints, and it's based on the type of cartilage. Uh, let me just make cheat and make that a little smaller. Put that in. Perfect. And then I can. The first is what we call a synchondrosis. A synchondrosis is a joint where the two bones are held together by hyaline cartilage. All right. The classic example, and we just talked about it a moment ago, involves the rib cage. Your first rib, where it connects to your um, uh, sternum, is basically a swivel point. All right. I think we've done this in this class. What makes the world go round? And that pressure. 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 Yeah. pressure makes the world go round. Absolutely. The way what keeps you alive is that you are able to like almost like the handle of a bucket, swing your ribs up and down. And as you swing your ribs up and down, it changes the volume of your thoracic cavity and allows you when you increase it to bring air in. When you decrease it, you blow air out. To be able to swing like a handle of a, of a pail you need to have a pivot point. And that's what the first rib is. This first rib joint is a cartilaginous synchondrosis, anchor point, so that everything else can swivel up and down from there. Now, if you're gonna have a good swivel point, should that swivel point move? No. No, so what would the functional classification of a synchondrosis be? Synarthrosis. Excellent, synarthrosis. Now, let's take it one step further if you don't understand the rib connection. The epiphyseal plate is hyaline cartilage, isn't it? And basically, yeah. it holds the diaphysis of a bone, which is bone connective tissue, to the epiphysis of the bone, which is bone connective tissue. So you could argue that that epiphyseal plate is actually a synchondrosis. You have two bones held together by hyaline cartilage. And in your bones as you're growing, should the head of your long bones wobble in relation to their diaphysis? No. No, so again, this is a synarthrosis. And I can do you one better. What happens to our epiphyseal plate? It solidifies or closes. It closes, it ossifies, and it becomes a thin line of compact bone. And when it becomes that epiphyseal line, a thin line of compact bone heading, holding the epiphysis and the diaphysis together, guess what kind of joint it is then? Synostosis. Not a joint? Synostosis. It's a synostosis. Is it a joint still? Synostosis, bone. where bone connective tissue holds the two together. And notice both of those are synarthritic. The head of the epiphysis should never wobble on the diaphysis. Excellent. So are, most, um, are most of them synarthrotic? Like very few are different ones. You are noticing a very cool trend. I, I like that you're catching that. Absolutely. Let's finish off this last one and see if our trend breaks. Our last type of cartilaginous joint is what is called a symphysis. 
with a symphysis, basically the two bones are held together by fibrocartilage. Right? The classic example, as I mentioned, is that pubic symphysis where we have that movement of the pelvis. But if you think about it, in between our vertebrae, we have chunks of fibrocartilage, right? And we have limited movement of our vertebrae, but not free range movement, right? I can't bend my back halfway over 90 degrees or something like that, right? So again, we have these sympathies. Uh, and also notice all of our sympathies are all located on the midline of the body whether it's the pubic symphysis or the intervertebral joints, they're all along the midline of the body. And I think I gave it away, but uh, we'll do it anyway. The functional classification of these is an amphiarthrosis. Amphi. Yep. Oh, there, I did, did miss the eye. There you go, amphiarthrosis. Excellent. Now, to get back, I think Julia was the one who pointed it out. You've hit the nail on the head. Notice every single one of these joints that we have identified so far, all of the cartilaginous specific types, all of the fibrous specific types, the synostosis, all of them are either synarthritic or diarthritic. But there is one more classification of joints, synovial joints. And there's one more classification of functional types, diarthroses. And those two go hand in hand, All right? So as it turns out, all diarthroses are synovial joints. and all synovial joints are diarthritic. That makes it easier. For those, absolutely, it does make it easier. We talked about synovial joints when we talked about our membranes. We talked about synovial membranes back then. And we'll talk about them again uh, when we talk about the synovial joints in more detail. Now, of course, we have specific types of synovial joints. Anybody know how many specific types? There's six of them. Six of them, absolutely. There are six specific types of synovial joints. We will talk about synovial joints in much more depth when we get to that uh, on Tuesday actually is when we'll do that because uh, there's a lot we have to talk about the characteristics of the synovial joint, talk about the synovial membrane again, identify the shapes of the six synovial joints. But the good news is that all six types, uh, specific types of synovial joints functionally are all diarthritic. So all synovial joints are diarthritic, all diarthritic joints are synovial. And this is what that handout we had shows us. Now, I've done it here in words, but as promised, we've got these great pictures from your textbook. So again, we have identified the functional classifications, the structural classifications, and have identified those. But let's also look at specific examples. Here for our fibrous joints, Remember, as we talked about, the first specific type of fibrous joint is a suture. All fibrous joints have a fibrous connective tissue that holds them together. Oops. And they're either going to provide no movement or limited movement, because again, we know they're not going to be diarthritic. Three specific types, starting first with the suture, only found in the skull where we have this dense fibrous connective tissue that knits the bones together and functionally is synarthritic. Now, 
I know we don't have the advantage of being able to hold the skulls in our hand like if we were in the classroom. But if any of you have ever seen a skull or even looked at pictures of skulls on the internet, one of the things you may notice is it doesn't look like fibrous connective tissue that holds them together. Because what happens as we age is those collagen fibers start to collect calcium, start to produce hydroxyapatite crystals on them. And as we age, typically from about age 30 and up, those sutures have completely ossified and become bone. And of course, when they completely ossify and become bone, then technically they become synostosis, where we have a little bit of bone connective tissue that holds them together. And as we said, functionally, they are synarthritic. The second type is a syndesmosis. Notice, oh, actually, that's what I wanted to show you. Hold on. Oh, I don't have it. All right, let's see if I can do it this way. Oh, thanks. And of course, now I can't find it. Chucks. All right, I'll cheat and use then this picture instead. All right, that'll work. We'll use this one. All right. So. Our second type is a syndesmosis. This is where either a ligament or an interosseous membrane holds the bones together. Now, the example your book gives you is this one here, where you can see there's a little bit of a ligament that is holding the distal head of the fibia to the distal head of the tibia. However, I don't think this is the best example of this. I'll see if I can find our, our uh, chart from the classroom, uh, the, the site uh, for, um, for Cosumnes River didn't have it. But if we look at this bone picture here, what you will actually see on some of the charts is that there is this fibrous membrane between these two parallel bones. So you find it between the radius and the ulna, and you find it between the tibia and the fibula. And this long fibrous membrane that is holding them together is another example of a syndesmosis. And so it allows some little flexibility of movement. I'm able to rotate it back and forth, although as we'll learn, that's not the correct term for that. That's not a true rotation, but we'll worry about that movement later. Um, but we have those syndesmoses that hold the space in between. So like I said, that's not a good example. I'll see if I can find an example. So remember, suture, a suture is not cartilage. Suture is bone. So we're putting bone together. So you are correct in that when you are correct. Okay, so I see what you're going. Yes, when you break a bone and that fibrocartilage forms, that would be an example of a symphysis that then ossifies to become uh, uh, to become an example of that. So yes, that would be true as well. All right, and as we said, this is amphiarthritic. And the third part, and here we see, is that gomphosis. This is specifically for the teeth. And as I mentioned, you can see where the ovioli, basically the pocket, the hole in the mandible or maxilla is. Then you have the structure of the tooth in here. And then in between them, you have this periodontal ligament that is a fibrous connective tissue that holds and anchors it into place. All right, what's not a cartilage? The suture, yeah, sutures are not cartilage. Excellent. 
We also have the specific cartilaginous joints. Again, notice that the classic example that we use is uh, the cartilage, the hyaline cartilage that holds the first rib to the manubrium of the sternum as that anchor point. But as we also talked about, technically, the epiphyseal plate is a chunk of hyaline cartilage that holds the epiphysis to the diaphysis. So technically, you could call that a joint as well. And so both of those would be examples of a synchondrosis, where hyaline cartilage holds the bones together. And as we talked about, when this epiphyseal plate ossifies and becomes bone, the epiphyseal line, then technically, when it becomes an epiphyseal line, it would be a synostosis. And I guess technically you could say the same thing about a break. When it's fiber cartilage, it's a symphysis. That, that fiber cartilage callus would be a symphysis. And then the bony callus would be a synostosis. So yeah, I buy that. All right. Lastly, our last cartilaginous joint, again, is a symphysis, fibrocartilage. And here's that example I keep mentioning, that pubic symphysis that holds the, pel the two pubic bones together, forming the pelvis. But the intervertebral discs between the vertebrae are also fibrocartilage. So those are also uh, examples of symphyses. And notice they're all along the midline. So we have those as well. So those are almost all of our specific types and structural types. Like I said, we do need to talk about our synovial joints and there are indeed six specific types, but we need to talk some anatomy of the synovial joint first, then we can talk about the anatomy of the specific types. And then we can talk about the functions that they allow. So that is all the stuff that we are going to be doing on Tuesday. So this is everything that I wanted to cover for lecture today. So what we are left with is lab. All right, so any questions? Let's go back to this to look at while we uh, talk about this. So any questions on these definitions for our structural, our functional, or our specific types of joints? Actually, let's lie. Let's come back here to this picture. Because on the exam, I could have a big fat arrow and a picture like this, and I could point it right there to that region. And if you notice, there are basically three questions I could ask. I could ask you to identify the functional classification of this joint. And what would your answer to that be? Let's make my arrow bigger even though the picture is not bigger. But on the exam, if I had this arrow pointing to this region and I asked you for the functional classification of this joint, what would your answer be? Amphiarthrosis. Amphiarthrosis. Same picture, same arrow, but I asked you the structural classification. What would your answer be? Fibrous? Close. It's not fibrous, what is it? That fibrous is a structural classification, but not this one. What's this one? Cartilaginous. Cartilaginous, excellent. And then the third question I could ask you is identify the specific type of joint. What is the specific type of joint? Symphysis. Symphysis, there you go. It's just that simple. Those will be the three questions that I could ask when pointing at one of these joints. Structural classification, functional classification, specific type. So that's why something like this is useful. Something like this is useful, like the handout that I have on Canvas for you that does this exact same thing, puts all the pieces together and lets you help to appreciate and understand how these things relate to each other. There isn't just one connective tissue that makes synovial joints. There are multiple connective tissues involved in making a synovial joint. So we'll define a synovial joint in general, and then also uh, talk about some specific examples of those on Thursday. So you're right, we're not done with this yet. We still have synovial joints to go, but we're saving that for Tuesday. So we will come back and we still have to finish this. But the first three specific types we've done. 
So I have a quick question. Yes. The cartilaginous joint, is that the one that's in the pubis? Yes, the pubic symphysis is an example of a cartilaginous type of joint, yes. And the reason why it's, it's cartilaginous is so that it can give, um, the, like hormonal stimulation can make it re more relaxed? No, the reason it is here, let's cheat and do this. Hold on, this is gonna be easier if I find it first. The reason it is cartilaginous is because when you look at this joint, what you see is that there are two bones, the left pubic bone and the right pubic bone. And those two bones are held together by a small chunk of fibrocartilage. So fibrocartilage holds the two bones together. And because it is a cartilage that holds the two bones together, it is a cartilaginous joint. It is a symphysis because the type of cartilage is fibrocartilage. And, and the fact that it is made of fibrocartilage does give it a little flexibility of movement, which is why it is an amphiarthrosis. Are there other joints that use um, the cartilaginous joint? Yes, so again, remember there are uh, synchondroses, like we talked about uh, with the first rib, like we talked about with the epiphyseal plate, and we also talked about for other symphyses, the intervertebral discs are examples of those. Like I said, if you're having trouble with these, your book does a nice job of describing them as well. So you can look at those for more examples and things along those lines as well. So I would, I would focus on that uh, and the handout and those other resources to help you to master this. All right, any other questions? All right, excellent. We have four groups we have to get through today. Uh, so I wanna make sure we have enough time from that. But uh, from the comments I've been hearing, I'm getting a sneaking suspicion that groups have not quite prepared as successfully as they should have for these presentations. Uh, so hopefully uh, let's take a teeny bit of a longer break. It's 2.27 right now. Why don't we come back at 2.45? So at 2.45, we will come back. I will break you guys into your groups, give you some time to work together and prepare, and then we will start our group presentations at 2.45. So give me a minute to get, oops, no, I don't want to do that. But I do want to do that. Give me a minute to get the groups broken up, and then we'll go ahead and take our breaks and then start our group presentations. Remember, if you haven't found bones already, there is a bone handout that has all the appendicular bones on it inside of uh, Canvas, so you can always use that. And again, you don't have to have anything formally written out. Just show us the bone, and you can draw your own arrows or use your highlighter to point at those things to make sense of it. All right, questions on that. All right, I'll see you guys at, uh, actually I've used it most of the time. Let's, we'll make it 250, give you guys a little bit more time. We'll come back at 250. So give me in a minute and I will get that set up and we will do that. <laughs> 